I'm going to invite you to take your seats. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's wonderful that we can gather and greet one another and have this time of fellowship. Good evening. My name is Jane Florence, and I'm currently serving as senior pastor here at this congregation, and I want to welcome you into this space. We are thrilled to be able to offer our space to a whole host of artists and choral performances throughout the year, but tonight is especially exciting. We thank all of those who have worked so hard to make this possible. Mary and all of our performers and our guests, we say welcome. And so we gather this evening in a sanctuary that is 124 years old, but this congregation began gathering back as far as 1857, before Lincoln was ever incorporated into a village. Our roots go back to the time when the Oto Missouri First Peoples of the Great Plains were removed from this land and confined to a government reservation. They once lived upon and moved across the land beneath the sky as the descendants of the indigenous people who had occupied the land of the Salt Valley for thousands of years. And they cared for the land, and they understood the land, and we have much to learn from them and are indebted to them. For years, the tribe watched as acre by acre of their land was sold off by the government to non-Indians, and they suffered as treaties were broken and food and medicine and livestock that they were promised was not delivered. The mortality rate climbed higher and higher year after year, and in 1881, they were moved to Red Rock, Oklahoma. Children taken away from parents, tribal elders not allowed to speak their native language, and we confess that there were Methodist missionaries that were also inflicting some of that great harm. So we repent for the sins of our ancestors upon this land and her native people. And tonight we honor the native culture in art, in word, and in song, celebrating the gifts of their spirit. Our next welcome will come from Reverend Dr. David Wilson, who is serving as residing bishop of the Great Plains Conference of the United Methodist Church since January of last year. He is a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and holds the distinction of being the first Native American elected to serve as bishop in the history of the United Methodist Church. Prior to election, Bishop Wilson served as the assistant to the bishop of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, which is comprised of 81 Native American churches in Oklahoma and Kansas and Texas. He has been honored by Oklahoma City University, the AARP. He was named Man of the Year by Changing Winds Cultural Society in 2017. He's also served as director for Rock the Native Vote, an initiative to engage Native Americans to vote in Oklahoma. He often lectures on Native American spirituality in classrooms and for groups. And he also enjoys running, studying history, in particular Native American history. His grandfather, Calvin Wilson, was one of the Choctaw Code Talkers from World War I. We are grateful for his leadership and for his presence here this evening, Bishop Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Halito Chimachokma Silchofa David Wilson. Uh, it's wonderful to be here tonight to be a part of this festival. I want to say thank you to Mary for the invitation to come and be a part of the First Nations uh, Choral Festival. Uh, folks are excited about tonight, and it's evident by our crowd. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, will you join me in prayer? Uh, gracious and loving God, we come tonight gathered from many places to come and celebrate who we are come and enjoy the wonderful music the folk who have prepared uh, the beautiful selections for us tonight and it helps us to think about who you are 
and who you are in our lives. We thank you for the uh, resilience of our indigenous people, not just here in Lincoln and across the Nebraska, but across this country. May you bless the performers tonight as they come and uh, share of this, uh, the wonderful, beautiful talent, the songs that you've given to us that remind us of who you are and whose we are. It is in the name of uh, the, the one we, we serve. Amen. We would not be here tonight, my friends, without the planning and vision of uh, Mary Young, our festival coordinator. She is a doctoral candidate at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and her area of research is Native American music. Uh, this festival is her passion, uh, her passion project. I'm so pleased to welcome her to the stage so she can tell you more about tonight. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I just wanted to give you some background as to how this came about. So um, as the bishop just said, I'm a third year DMA choral conducting candidate at the university and my area of research is Native American music. I started out three years ago researching the music of underrepresented composers for organizations like the New York Choral Consortium and the Institute for Composer Diversity. Did a couple of projects on underrepresented people groups and I was on a Zoom call and they said to me, what would you like to research next? And they threw out some options. And I said, out of the clear blue sky, I'm fascinated with Native American culture. I'm not Native in any way, it's just an academic interest. And I said, I would love to research Native American choral music. And I was told, there is none. And the more people that I asked, the more I got that same response. There is none. Native Americans don't organize themselves into choirs, and that type of music does not or should not exist. But I was delighted to find, after some digging, there are composers who are of Native heritage, who are connected with their communities, who write choral music, and who are supportive of their art being presented in that form. And it became my mission to lift them up, commission them. So I applied for a grant from the university to commission a piece, which you will hear tonight. We got the grant. And I partnered with my wonderful friend, composer, Dr. William Linthicum Blackhorse, who's here tonight, commissioned him to write the piece, and then thought, why don't we turn it into a whole concert of music only by Native Americans, only in indigenous languages? And then somebody said, you need to talk to Judy. And so I said, okay. So I went and talked to Judy, and I sat in her office, and I said, I want this to be so much more than a concert. I want art, and I want poetry, and I want storytelling, because I wanted it to be cross-curricular. And boy, did she deliver. She put me up with all these kinds of connections. And so I just wanted to let you know some of our distinguished guests who are here tonight who made today possible. Our festival artist is Sarah Rowe. Her, her art is in the back of the sanctuary. She also, um, all of the art... Oh dear. All of the art on the screens that you'll see tonight is by Sarah Rowe. Now she is stuck in traffic as I understand it and on her way here. <gasps> She's here, hi Sarah! Hello! Sarah's here, and she's a wonderful, wonderful artist. She volunteered of her own free will. She said, send me every single piece on the program. I will listen to every single one and curate an artwork for every single one, and she did, and you'll see them on the screen tonight as the pieces are being performed. Aaliyah American Horse, our youth poet laureate for the state, is a native. She's here. She's going to be presenting some of her poetry. Of course, we couldn't do any of this without Judy Gashkabash, uh, and you've already met um, you've already met Bishop Wilson, and at this time, I'd like to invite Senator Brewer to the stage. Senator Brewer is a retired U.S. Army colonel with over 37 years of service, including two Purple Hearts. He's a member of the Oglagla Lakota Sioux Tribe. He grew up on and near the Pine Ridge Reservation. Senator Brewer was elected in 2016 and re-elected in 2020 to represent the 43rd District to the Nebraska Legislature. He is the first state senator of Native American descent to serve in Nebraska's unicameral. Welcome, Senator. Kind of hard to follow Mary. She's got so much energy. Uh, 
We had a, uh, a filibuster today. That's how you spend some of your days in the legislature. So it is such a relief to be here tonight and to see all the folks that took the time to come here tonight. I'm excited about this festival. Uh, a little worried though, because Mary, when I came in, she's like, you know, we're gonna have some singing. I'm like, listen, they divided us amongst the, the fighters and the singers. I was always in the fighters, not the singers. So uh, hopefully she's not expecting a lot. Uh, today I had an opportunity, I got, that they send these uh, white slips in to the, to the chamber floor because nobody can go there and it said, hey, you, you have someone out here to see you, a distinguished guest, and, uh, well, I better, it's usually a lobbyist just trying to fake you out and make you come out there. But I came out and it was Ernie Chambers and I hadn't seen Ernie almost in four years because that's when he had finished. And uh, he said, hey, um, I'm coming back to the legislature. And I said, well, you're, you're kind of timing it. Well, I'm not going to get to see you because I'll be going out and you're coming in. He goes, well, I do want to come by and talk to you. He goes, uh, I'm excited about coming back. And I said, well, I'm going to miss you because he was, he was actually a really good mentor because he actually read the rules and followed them, which most don't. <laughs> and he asked me a question that kind of all of a sudden hit home because after seven and a half years in that chamber, uh, fighting to figure out ways to, to help different groups and detax this and build roads. He said, well, what are you going to remember as the one thing that is going to stick in your mind that was the most important of your time in the legislature? And I said, you know, I said closing the liquor stores at White Clay was a big deal. It, it changed a lot of lives. But I think that the thing that will live way beyond any of us that were in that chamber is the work that we were able to put in to have the statue and statutory hall in Washington, D.C. changed from William Jennings Bryant to Standing Bear. And <laughs> if, if you've never been to Washington, D.C. to see it, Please try and make the trip. The one we have on the mall is, is amazing, but Judy was the force behind really everything good that's happened with Native Americans as long as I've been around. I was on the Indian Commission with her. She's an incredible visionary person. She believed we could do it. We wrote the legislation. She, she was the one behind finding the money, and that was a big part of it because we couldn't use state money for this. And so she deserves the credit for that statue being able to be in statutory hall. But we also had, I think, what I would call divine intervention because William Jennings Bryant was a kind of a short, dingy, brown statue that was kind of wedged in a, in a nowhere spot. And it just happened the day that we got approval and we brought in Standing Bear there was an opening just outside the chambers on the main part of the, of, of the floor as you come out, and that's where Standing Bear ended up. They put a big, I don't know, like a parachute over him because they didn't want anybody to see him until the ceremony. But there are moments in your life where you want to just freeze frame it. And when they pulled that back and this statue of Standing Bear was there, and it shined because they, that one's a little more polished than the one here in the mall, it took your breath away, and now everybody who comes to Washington, D.C. are getting their pictures taken with Standing Bear, and they're learning the story behind Standing Bear. And so uh, tonight, I want to say, Judy, thank you for what you've done to make Native people proud. You, you've done a great job, and we couldn't ask for someone better to be in that role. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Am I supposed to do anything now? Just get out of the way, all right.
Oh, it's the mic's on. Um, my name is William Linthicum Blackhorse, and I just want to share something with you real quick. It was, um, I didn't grow up on the reservation. I didn't grow up with my reservation family. My parents wanted me to live a life away from it. My grandmother wanted me to live a life away from it. And I understand my relatives on the, on the reservations up in South Dakota, they have hard lives. Alcohol, drugs is a really big problem on the reservations. And, but the culture is so bright, so brilliant, so beautiful. And I found my family later in life as a gay young man. It was hard growing up with a family that was very conservative Christian. And I couldn't really find a home. And I found my home with my Sichangu and Oglala relatives up in South Dakota. And they brought me into the Sundance and gave me a chance to experience the culture that I was estranged from. And this song comes from that ceremony. It's a very sacred, very beautiful song, but it also is a part of the spiritual society that I'm a part of. And so I brought this to the people to share with you so that way everyone can enjoy and experience the spirituality that we share with people worldwide. From all over the planet, they come to the reservations to learn and to experience the power of spiritual healing. And so I hope you enjoy this music and understand the reverence and the, and the um, weight of the moment. It's the first time a traditional song has been put into a choral setting like this. And so I hope you enjoy it and thank you for everything you do for us.
Hi, my name is James Green, and I am so honored that my Cherokee pieces are included with the First Nations Choral Festival. Um, Mary Young has just been amazing with her desire to help keep these languages alive and to bring Native and Indigenous music to the forefront. I get so excited by, when I speak with her. I mean, it has brought along additional titles that I've um, composed. So I want to take this opportunity to introduce you to some of my music. Um, you guys will be doing All My Trials, Cherokee All My Trials, and that one came about in a very interesting way. But first, let me explain that Oftentimes what I do is I'll take Western music and combine it with the Cherokee language so that it, people somehow, they're able to let that in a little bit better um, because usually it's a familiar tune that they're used to singing. And not only that, but even the Cherokee pieces of old are usually pulled from hymns with different words, of course, and different texts, but the melodies are usually pulled from these Christian hymns and so or spirituals. Um, so I used all my trials, and the reason why I did that was because um, a dear friend of mine, Ganilla Luboff, who is the former owner and publisher of Walton Music, um, suggested that I use her late husband's English arrangement of all my trials. And that reason is because um, Norman Luboff's longtime nanny was Cherokee. She raised his kids and she's really basically a part of their family. And this is to honor her and also honor me and my family. The main thing about uh, With All My Trials, Cherokee All My Trials, is that it, it's mother comforting the young. And that's what a lot of the hymns do or the Cherokee titles do because of the Trail of Tears. This one was not sung on the Trail of Tears, but it has the same feeling. Um, like, for example, in the part where it says, Now hush, baby, na ku ikla, we u sti. Um, I, I, I had trouble finding a translation for that. Uh, I had to reach out to Kathy Sahara, who's the language coordinator with the Cherokee Nation, and she's just been so helpful with me. And she actually said, you will not believe this, James, but we just performed this piece not long ago, so I have that translation already. So, yay. The second title um, is North Wind, um, and that one is a title that's loosely based on a poor wayfaring stranger. So you'll recognize that melody, and this was performed on the Trail of Tears. And I have actually have two versions of this one. I have a simple version that is fitting for younger students, you know, middle school, even elementary, um, that's not as extensive, not with Devisi, um, a lot of, it doesn't take a lot of forces. You can even sing it in unison. But this version that you guys are gonna do and hear today is the what I call the extensive the slightly more complicated version. Now the part in that that really pulled me is, it says narrow is the road where all the good people went. And to me, even though the road is narrow on the Trail of Tears and long and it's hard, but when we get there, we will live free and we will be home. It's about perseverance, it's about adapting, it's about becoming. So that's the reason why I like to take the Western music styles and combine it with the Cherokee language. Um, and the last one you'll hear in this first section is um, Guide Me As I Walk Along. It's a Cherokee hymn. And this one actually uses the Eastern dialect. And I hope you enjoy these pieces. And again, thank you for performing them. Thank you for putting your time and energy into them because believe it or not, that does help keep the language alive. Wado.
Good evening. Oh, sorry. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's such a blessing to be up here. My name is Aaliyah American Horse. Um, I come from the Ogallala Lakota Sioux Tribe. Um, last year, I was titled the Midwest or Nebraska Youth Poet Laureate, and this year, I was titled the Midwest Youth Poet Laureate. And hopefully, in April, when I go to nationals in D.C., I'll become the National Youth Poet Laureate. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I write a lot of poetry about what being Native American is like. Um, growing up in Gordon, Nebraska, which is about 20 minutes away from the Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, you tend to see a lot of things, a lot of pain, um, and also a lot of healing, um, which is what I like to portray in my writing. I like to talk about um, just things I see, addiction, pain, um, suicide, mental health, things like that, missing and murdered indigenous woman. Um, but today I have written a poem for you called, I Want Those Red Shoes. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Walking the Red Road. Um, if you haven't, it's just a road of healing and sobriety and just a path to get, um, to get closer with Creator. This is, I want those red shoes. I start off with a quote by Black Elk. 
Let every step you take upon this earth be as a prayer. This path I've taken has left sores on the bottoms of my feet, holes in these dusty old shoes. This pain has traveled up my bones, growing mold on my spirit and heart. When I look at the road just next to mine, when the sun sets, why does their courage beacon a light in the direction they walk, but I tread the dark? When it rains, why do they splash in the puddles, but I take cover? When there's a hill, why do they choose to climb, but I find a shortcut? That road, only a strong heart can walk. So why do I want to walk it? Thank you.
once again, um, I would like to introduce you to one additional Cherokee piece entitled Okana Lefty, Walking by the Cherokee River. And I actually started writing this piece back in 2012 after my family and I visited Cherokee, North Carolina. I'm actually from North Carolina, about five hours from Cherokee. And, you know, we went to the mountains to visit and visit with a, a dear friend of mine. And we decided to go tubing on the Oconaluftee River. And by accident, I think our tubing guide took us up too high on the river. And so I thought we were going to lose our life. You know, it was like the whitewater rapids coming down. And it was just the, the most fearful thing I'd ever experienced. And so I put this piece on the back burner for a while. And a friend of mine contacted me and asked recently and said, did you ever finish writing that piece you were going to sing in praise of the Okana Lefty River? And I was like, well, no, because I thought it was going to kill me. Um, so she put a different spin on it. She said, did you ever think that maybe the river saved your life? So that's all I needed to hear. And I, I practically finished the piece that night. And it, again, this is the original piece. And it, it incorporates more of a native sound as opposed to my previous titles other than got me as I walk along had more, it was more western with Cherokee um, language attached to it this is more of a native sound um, and it, it has flute with it but you can also use violin um, as early Cherokee music was known for fiddle music um, you know it was from the mountains of North Carolina I did want to let you know that O'Connor Lefty I feel is a misheard word by early settlers Equinalti is actually what the name was originally and is based on the community that lived by that river, the early Cherokee tribe that lived by the river. And I feel that they misheard that as Okanalefti, just as Jalagi is how you actually say Cherokee. In Cherokee is Jalagi, and I think that was misheard as well. But this piece is very special to me. And um, I'm so excited about you guys singing this and, and, taking, and taking on the text and the language and just finding joy in doing so. And I also want to thank you for helping to keep the Cherokee language alive. Wado. Shall I keep moving on? Oh, no, no. 
Hi again. <laughs> um, so like I mentioned before, I've spent the last year as the Nebraska Youth Poet Laureate. Um, and into coming into this position, I definitely wasn't in a place where I wanted to be. And through writing my poetry and um, really becoming closer with my culture, I've gone on this healing journey. Um, I actually spent the last two months in Utah where I was born um, connecting with um, just the traditional lifestyle. And I found it really so relieving to just be at one with creator and find myself on this path of not only sobriety and healing, but just happiness that I've never experienced before. So when Mary asked me to um, put together a piece based on um, a journey, I thought, what is the journey everyone walks? Life itself. Um, so I wrote this piece dedicated to my grandmother um, in really finding, um, how do I say this? Dedicated to my grandmother who, had pa who passed away um, in what I would like to tell her when I see her next. So this is when I see you next. When I see you next, Unchi, I hope I fill your chest with pride. We will sing and dance in celebration of success. When Creator takes me home, I will greet you with stories, the ones you have already seen from the great eagle's nest. I will hold your hand as we walk into the spirit world, our hearts crested in thankfulness for the guidance blessed upon us and a familiar love so precious. Thank you, Wompilatanka.
too tall for this mic. <laughs> the piece you're about to hear in the Lakota language is called Hambleble. Hambleble means as in a dream, but not as in a dream <laughs> in the way that you would put it as um, something fleeting. It's as in a dream, as in something that grabs you and brings you into the spirit. When we, this song, I decided to write this. This actually started out as a commission. Um, Mary reached out to me and she wanted to commission a piece uh, that was honoring the Lakota culture, honoring my heritage, honoring um, the, just, just in general honoring the Native American heritage of this country. And I said, well, you know, I think what I'll do is I'll write about my experiences at my very first Sundance. We have a ceremony that's very sacred. It's called an amblechia. Amblechia means vision quest ceremony. Um, uh, to give you a brief example, it's four days and four nights out on a hill by yourself with no food, no water, and you're surrounded by sacred materials that you've prepared and your supporters have prepared for you. And you make your own personal pipe completely by hand 
and you go out there all by yourself and you're praying for a vision, asking the spirits to give you guidance, all four directions, you're facing the wind and you're asking for that wind to show you a vision. I took four traditional songs that are part of this ceremony. We start in the sweat lodge, or we call the inipi. The sweat lodge ceremony, you'll hear steam on the rocks and you'll hear the four directions song. And I won't, I won't sing um, the Four Directions song with the directions name. I'll say Tratuye Topa for my relatives who speak Lakota. It means four directions. I'm going to give you an example of these four songs. The first one is the Four Directions songs. <clears throat> That's the four direction song. After that song is sung, then the pipe song for the home, for the personal pipe. I made my very first pipe completely out by hand out of a pipe stone that I pulled out of a quarry in Pipestone, uh, Mon what was it, Pipestone, Montana? I can't remember where it is, it's Pipestone. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I made the pipe and I had to give it away. I, I wasn't allowed to keep it. That's part of the ceremony. And the pipe song is beautiful and it goes, Chanu Pawani Chau Peloi Tayayu Zayoyohe Ognash Mayagna Yekilo Hewa Chaya Hewa Yelohe the song is a warning. It's teaching you to hold the pipe properly. Tanya yuza yo. Ognash mayagnaya kilo. You know, hold it in a sacred manner. Hey, wakanya iwayalo. You have to treat the pipe with integrity and hold it in a sacred manner. Do this because I warn you, you won't listen to me but hold it in a sacred manner. That's what that song's about. The third song is the four directions song when you're on the Amblechia, the vision quest. You face each direction and you look to the winds and you ask for guidance. And again, I won't sing each direction um, out of respect for the song and its sacred sermon, but I'll use Tatuye Topa again, four directions. You're praying for a vision. The wind is blowing in my face. You'll hear the wind as it comes in during the song. And then the final song is the rocks. As soon as the ceremony began, it was over for me. It felt so fast. Four days, four nights, no fear of water, then I had a vision and I woke up in the sweat lodge. And so you'll hear the steam on the rocks and you'll hear the four directions, or you'll hear the, um, the rock song. <laughs> It's talking about being here with my relatives gives me life. That's what those words mean. The rocks have pity on us. Give us pity, the heat, the steam. Being here with my relatives brings me life. And I have one last thing I want to say um, before this is done. Tunkashila <laughs> 
un oyate lila a wichake ani. Chahe un gleun kiapis a. Ho hecha tuelo, mitako yase in. Grandfather Spirit, you make me happy. Grandfather Spirit, you walk with me. You take all of our wrongdoings away from us. The arts make us feel truly alive, and that's why we keep going back to them. This is all I have to say. Thank you.
All right, so the last piece, I hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs> the, the last piece that you're going to hear tonight is a traditional lullaby. And it is, it is a lullaby, it's, it's beautiful. It uses um, ancient and modern Lakota language because you know, some of these songs are so old, we don't even know where they, where they started. But we know that they've been used for hundreds of years and adapted and changed and added upon. And this is a perfect example of one of those songs where the beginning of it is ancient Lakota and the, in the middle section, the second half is modern Lakota. <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit about how this piece came to life. <laughs> Sorry, it, it's a hard topic to talk about. Um, so I was asked last year to write for the American Coal Directors Association Conference for the Indigenous Peoples Concert. They had a whole bunch of music, and it was the first time they ever did a concert like that of all Indigenous composers at a major conference. Um, Jay Saplan, a Hawaiian conductor, he reached out to me, or excuse me, they reached out to me, and wanted to know if I had anything for SATB, four-part mixed choir arrangements, and I didn't at the time. And so I said, okay, I'll work on something, but I had to get it done in three weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> I, um, at that time, I was also in communication with Mary, and we had just gotten off a phone call, and that next day I started working on the piece. I got halfway through the piece that day. I woke up the next morning, and the Uvalde shooting had occurred. And uh, sorry, it's, it's hard to talk about. Uh, but I live in Texas, and Uvalde, when that happened, the entire state shut down. And uh, I didn't know what to do. For two straight weeks, I couldn't touch the music. It's a lullaby about children. How do you write a children's lullaby after something like that happens? And so I waited, and I decided I had to get it done. And so I did, and uh, I just let the music the writing take its course, and I realized when the piece was finished that I wrote it with those kids' memories in my mind. And the, it's, uh, it, I decided to dedicate it to those children because if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't, this piece wouldn't sound the way it does. And it's, it's stunningly beautiful the way it turned out, but it's, the story behind it is so tragic. But I just hope you enjoy it. I hope you love it. It's still a children's lullaby, you know. Um, but again, we can do we can do better. We can do better in this country. I know we can. So enjoy. Okay, it's 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 time to sing, Senator. This is your last chance to run. So I'm going to teach you this lullaby in the traditional way that they would have taught it to their children. And any time you hear it in the piece, you're welcome to sing along. So I will sing a line of the music that you see behind me, and then you will copy, and we'll go back and forth. So my turn first. Ah,
Namaste, we're Let's try the whole thing. So we will conclude with this piece, after which you can have an excellent night.
Wopilataka Pilamayapalo, have a great evening.